Well, praise the Lord. It's great to be alive. At least I think it is anyway. <laughs> We're glad to be with you for another Discipleship Empowerment Word. What a journey we've been on. We've been looking at words like righteousness, and now we're looking at the word holy, and that took us into the study of Exodus a little bit about how the word holy is used there, and and then how it really brought together the whole idea of the tabernacle, how different people, places, and things in the tabernacle were set aside to be holy. Well, we're just so glad we're going to continue on our journey. We're still looking at the word holy. I know many people were thinking, oh, are we looking at the word anointing? Are we looking at the word tabernacle? Or what is it that we're looking at? And we're not really, we're not trying to study those ones. We were trying to study how the word holy is connected. And it's interesting, as I was beginning to prepare yesterday for today, uh, I was thinking about our journey of holy and holiness to this part was mostly in the book of Exodus, even though we connected it through into the New Testament and that, which we should, as Colwyn was saying, often she says to me, the connecting of the dots <laughs> between the Old and the New Testament. And uh, now as we go on from Exodus, we're going to move into Leviticus. And the thing that you see a lot about this word holy and I guess if we were to put a title today as we look into Leviticus, it's just a holy God. We have a holy God who has created all the heavens and the earth. And it was interesting that when you look at the book of Exodus, it was a book that's, that's preparing and creating a place for God's presence amongst them. And uh, how it had to be holy. And if you look in the Leviticus and you see this term holy again, as we will this morning, a lot of it's got to do with the holy name or a holy God. What he does, his holy place, his holy presence. You know, God so desires to be with us. And I love that because when you go into, of course, the New Testament and you know the very familiar scripture of John 14 six, you know, for God's, or I should say John, John three sixteen, you know, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever would believe in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. That just shows his great desire for relationship, how a holy God wants to come unto the people. But one of the criterias was is that we had also become holy as he is holy. And you think, well, how in the world is that possible? Well, it's not possible in ourselves. There is no way we don't have the strength. We don't have the ability. And in this kind of old tabernacle, if you want to call it, you know, it's just an impossibility. But when we become born again and die to ourselves and live for Christ and allow him to build within us a new tabernacle, a new creation, giving us new garments and giving us a new name, then we can come and stand before a holy God. And that's what it's all about. And often it's not because we're pure, pure, but because of how we're covered, how we've been given over, and how we're now a child of God. Isn't that wonderful? You know, it takes off a lot of the pressure when you think about it. So as we go into Leviticus now, we're going to look at how it talks about this whole idea of holy God. And again, there's going to be some uh, uh, overlap because uh, we're now talking about how the Levites and others are, are viewing God and how God wants to be viewed. That's this, this, The interesting thing is in Leviticus, it's almost like God is now, not only did he give Moses the vision of the tabernacle and how the people should walk in the wilderness, and how he would provide for them. But it's like he, he draws another picture and say, you know, I, this is how I want you to see God. How I want you to see me. I guess, you know, we a lot of people have the picture of Jesus hanging up in their church or hanging up on their wall. Or they have a, a picture of the cross or something like that. But I just, when I was thinking about God himself, how would you envision that? How would you picture that? And and to me, um, because I'm working on another little booklet called The Good News, one of the things that has 
come to my mind so much is that how God is just a pure light and uh, how everything he's done is just is done in purity. And the way I, I think that we're going to see when we get into the heavens is that, that there's just going to be this Shekinah glory of a soft, pure light radiating out from God. And I, and I think that's the way I, I can only understand it, you know, because a lot of times I'm a, a picture person and I need to see things in picture form. And I'm just thinking about this pure, radiating, warm light coming from the throne of God. And it's just how it how it just kind of melts right into you and just touches you deep inside. And so I know many of you may have other ways to envision or to have a picture of of God's holiness. But to me, that's what it would be. You know, I know that when the people of Israel, we saw in the end of Exodus, how they had a cloud by day and a fire by night. You know, I, I mean, that's an amazing part right there. To, that's how they would see God. You know, I don't know about you. I was thinking about when we were walking, Cohen and I, uh, look, walking around God, uh, God's garden the other day. And because uh, we got a friend um, who sent us a bunch of pictures of her garden. And I won't name her, but she's probably watching right now. And I'm thinking... Well, I'm going to go around and walk around God's garden and I went around and, walk, and I took all kinds of pictures, you know, and uh, but that, but while I was taking pictures of flowers and, and uh, lady slippers and, and all kinds of pictures of different of God's beautiful creation, I got looking up into the heavens and uh, just noticed a lot of fluffy clouds. And I thought what that would be like to be able just to think of, <laughs> can you imagine taking a picture of the clouds and hanging up on your wall at home and saying, this is God, <laughs> you know what I mean? Or a fire, a, a beautiful fire, a campfire, and this is God. Well, to me, I just, I got, as I say, thinking about how God is just a radiating light. And so I know you might think I'm a little bit weird on that, but that's okay. I like to envision things. How about you? Do you like to envision things? Do you see the things when you look at the flowers and look at different things and God's creation? And we got a bird out here, a robin, that's been building a nest. And, and hubby and, and, and his wife are, are spending time together getting it all ready. You know, and I'm just thinking how God has put, you know, his beauty, his beauty in so much around us. And so, but to try to get this idea of a holy God, I, I think it's just one of those things that are just outside of who we are. It's, it's, we got a little bit of ideas about how that would be envisioned or pictured. But, uh, I think it would always be a struggle that we'll never really get the full picture of a holy God, you know, uh, and, until we go to be with him. Amen. So let's begin and look at, uh, Leviticus chapter six. Uh, verse 7, I should say, yeah, Leviticus 6, verses 17 and 18 is where I want to go to start off, where he says, it, it shall be, uh, it shall not be baked with leaven, it shall give, be, um, I have given it as a portion of my offering made by free, by fire, it is most holy, like the sin offering and the trespass offering. And he goes on and he talks about all the males amongst the children of Aaron may eat of it, and it shall be uh, a statute before your generations concerning the offering made of the fire up to the Lord. Everyone who touches it then must be holy. And so, you know, we're, we're beginning as we look at the instruction that when you're going to give your offering, you, you should... And, and I see Jesus talking about this in the New Testament. He says, you know, if you're going to bring an offering or something under the tabernacle and you don't got things right yet, go and get it right. Then come back and offer your offering. This is almost the same idea, you know, where it's talking about if you're going to be offering an offering to the Lord that is to be holy, you need to make sure that as you offer it, you're in a right state with God too. And that you offer it and that whoever touches it, whoever works with it, also must be holy. And I thought, wow, isn't that an amazing thought? 
And then you go over into uh, verse 30 says, but no sin offering from which any of the blood is brought into the tabernacle of the meeting or the tabernacle of the congregation to make atonement in the holy place shall be eaten. It shall be burned in fire. So here, this whole part of the uh, Leviticus chapter 6, it's talking to the Levites and the people how they should offer up their offering and how it should be holy unto the Lord. And so you, you get the idea in Leviticus, we have a holy Lord. And as we offer ourselves and we offer our offerings, they're also to be a holy unto the Lord. They're not supposed to be with blight or with blemish or, you know, sick or all those kinds of things. They were to be pure. And uh, I wonder about how does that work its way through other than that Jesus tells us, you know, to make sure that whatever you give unto the Lord, you give it with a with a clean and and uh, washed heart, which we would say under the blood of Christ. That as we give it, and I think that's why we can give joyfully. You know, whether we, however it is that we may be giving, we give joyfully, and we can give joyfully because we know that the offering is right. We know that our heart is right. We know that God is right, and it's like everything lines up, and it's just beautiful. It's just beautiful to watch what God does with what we give him. And it's almost like, you know, uh, sometimes with a child, you know, when you have a little bit of present, and, and you want to give them something, and you want to give them something that's beautiful and special, but maybe not even costly, and how they just enjoy it. And, you know, when they enjoy it, you enjoy it. You know, we haven't had an opportunity to be with our youngest grandchild yet in the last couple of years. But it was her birthday last week. And, and we sent her some presents through the mail and she got them. But to watch her on Zoom, how much she enjoyed her presents. Not only the first day, the second day. And still as she's playing with them and the things that she's wearing and saying, you know, we got these from Grandma and Grandpa. And thank you, Grandma and Grandpa. And you know what? She enjoyed them, but we enjoyed giving them and we enjoyed watching her receive them. And I think that's what a little bit like our Heavenly Father, that he just enjoys that when we give him and show him our love and, and, and he receives it, that there is a great joy and excitement. Well, we continue on as we go over in Leviticus chapter 8, verse 9. He says, and again, here we're back. So we're we're talking about the offering, how it should be given and how the people should stand. And of course, we have already talked about this because we've covered uh, concerning Aaron and his as the high priest and also his children. But he goes on here and he put on a turban on his head and also on the turban on the front. On its front, he put on the golden plate, the holy crown, as the Lord had commanded Moses. And so we had talked about that even yesterday about this holy crown and how it represents the, you know, the holiness of God. And, and I think that's what, you know, can you imagine what it would be to be a priest and to put on all the garments that was to be made holy and he was to be anointed as a, as a, a, a priest holy unto the Lord. And then to put a crown on, and you know, that would talk about, you know, the holiness of God. What a what a impact that must have had on the people. And again, I think that all that goes on here is that God is trying to say to the people over and over again, people, if you don't get anything else from what I am teaching you about the tabernacle and and our, our journey through the wilderness and how you're to be led by a fire and how you're to be led by a cloud. There's one thing you need to get over and over again, that God is holy. That God is holy. That God is holy. And everything he done, he was doing, was to remind them that God is holy. Looking at the tabernacle, God is holy. Looking at the furnishings, God is holy. Looking at the high priest, God is holy. God is a holy God. Amen. Then as we go over into chapter 11, 
verses uh, 44 and 45, we see here again where it gets a little bit more as, as again, remember this is like instructions that was given to the, the, the priest and to the people. Look what he says here. If you didn't get it, you know, by having on the crown, the holy garments, the holy tabernacle and all these things, he, he again, he begins to start to say over and over again in the book of Leviticus this. He says in verse 44 of chapter 11, For I am the Lord your God. He's saying, I am people of Israel. I am the Lord your God. Church, I am the Lord your God. Disciples, I am the Lord your God. And you shall therefore consecrate yourselves. You should then set yourselves aside. That idea of consecration made holy, set aside for a purpose for the Lord. You shall consecrate yourselves and you shall be holy. Wow. This is what you need to do. You shall consecrate yourselves and you shall be holy. For what reason? Why do we do that? He explains it here. Why? Why do we need to be holy? Why do we need to consecrate ourselves? He answers that question right here. Are you ready for it? Very simple. He said, let me try it again. You shall therefore consecrate yourselves and you shall be holy for I am holy. For I am holy, he says. You need to consecrate yourself because if you want to come into my presence and you want to come before me and you need to be holy, why? Because I am holy, he said. That's why. That's why when we... You know, often our prayers don't get answered. A lot of things don't happen because we've come in stained. We haven't come in yet washed and clean and properly, you know, uh, gone through the consecration where we prepare ourselves to be right before God because God is right. To be prepared holy before God because God is holy. And that's something that can't be done just like turning it on a light switch and turning it off and say, okay, Lord, I'm just dropping into your presence right now, parachuting you in. I know there's emergencies and there's, there's times that we don't maybe have the opportunities to prepare. But he is saying, you know, you need to be holy. I need to be holy. Why? Because I am holy. Now, we don't normally think about this. And I know uh, often that this whole idea of I am really became the thorn in the flesh for the Pharisees and the Sadducees in the New Testament. The book of John kept saying, I am this. Jesus said, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. I am the door. I am the light of the world. I am the shepherd. I am, you know, the beginning from the end. I mean, all these I am, they would be going back in their minds. They would be thinking about this where God said, I am. And for them, that's why they wanted to stone Jesus, because they were saying, you can't use that name, Jesus. You can't use that name, because that's a holy name. And you can't use a name that belongs to God. And, and Jesus said, no, you're not getting it. I am God, and I'm walking in your midst right now. And this is who I am. I am that I am. And that's why he's saying, and he's saying to the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the religious people, if you're going to want to have a relationship with me, you need to walk in holiness as I am walking in holiness. Well, it goes on. Neither shall you defile yourselves with any creeping thing or the cre that creeps on the earth. If it goes on, verse 45. For I am the Lord who brings you out of the land of Egypt. I am the one who has delivered you. The reason why I'm asking you to walk and, and, and come into a place of consecration and to come into a place of, of being right because I am the one that delivered you. Remember, Jesus is the one that set us free. Jesus is the one that cleanses. Jesus has made it, has brought us from death to life. I mean, everything we have, all our possessions, all that we have is because of the great I am, because he is holy and because we have given our lives by faith to him and so that we can come in. And he's reminding, he's reminding the people, you know, I want you to do, for I am the Lord who brings you out of the land of Egypt to be your God. I brought you out. I delivered you to be your God. There is no other reason than you, that you're alive than because I've delivered you. 
And we know when we go into Isaiah, he talks about the Messiah who was a redeemer and a deliverer. They were constantly reminded, maybe sometimes we need to be reminded, that where we've come from. You say, well, I haven't lived that battle life. No, no, you were still in bondage. You were still in Egypt. And the reason you have what you have now is because God has delivered you out of Egypt. And the thing that we need to praise him for ever and ever, we're no longer part of the world. We've been delivered from the world. And it was possible through Jesus Christ's holiness. Possible, because look what he goes on. He says, I have delivered you and to be your God. You shall therefore be holy. Wow. I don't know about you, but that kind of hits you right between the eye. He says, you shall therefore be holy, for I am holy. And what was the basis for all that? Why, why can God say to us, you shall be holy as I am holy? How can he say that to us? Because he says to it, he reminds him and says, I've been your deliverer. The Holy One has come down and delivered you from bondage of Egypt. The Holy One of God has fed you. The Holy One of God has pre prepared a tabernacle where we can meet together. The Holy One of God. And as I am holy, so should you. Wow. You say, well, it's impossible. Yeah, I know. We keep talking about it. It is impossible. But it is possible through Jesus Christ. It's impossible in you, but possible in him, right? That's why he says, you shall therefore be holy for I am holy. Then we go on into chapter 19. And this, we continue to move through this whole idea of his holiness. Chapter 19, verse 2. He says to them, speak to all the congregation of the children of Israel and say to them, now speak to them, Moses, the high priest, Aaron, Levites, speak to the whole congregation. Hopefully I'm speaking to the congregation today. Speak to the congregation, he said. He said, well, we don't have to believe in that stuff. That's Old Testament. No, it hasn't changed. God is the same today, yesterday, and tomorrow. Why? Because he is holy then, he is holy now, and he will continue to be holy tomorrow. That doesn't change. So the message is still the same. What is the message? Speak to the congregation of the children of Israel and say to them. This is an amazing thought. I don't know. I mean, it, it just blows me away thinking about, wow. What is you're supposed to say to them? You shall be holy for I, the Lord your God, am holy. I Wow. You know, they don't have the, the, the blessing of, of what Christ did on the cross as the Lamb of God that shed his blood. But he's saying to them, I want you to be holy because I am holy. And if you trust in me and you walk in me as I am holy, you will be holy. And you will be able to come before the Lord. Again, such a powerful, say to the congregation, say to the people. Say to all Israel. That's what, when it talks about the congregation, it's talking about all the million and a half people that came out of Egypt. Say to them, say to them, you shall be holy for I, for I, the Lord, your God, am holy. Wow. Then he goes over and, and again in chapter 20, uh, we get here in verse seven. He says to them, there's so many things here. He says, consecrate yourself, therefore. Again, as I told you when we began, what's the title of today's message? A holy God. Because here it comes again. Consecrate yourselves, therefore, and be holy. Consecrate. Get washed in the blood of the Lamb. Get set aside. Get in your mind that you're covered by the blood of the Lamb. Get in your heart that you are to be consecrated, set aside, set apart for a purpose. Consecrate yourselves and be holy. Why? For I am the Lord your God. As I am holy, we're to be holy. Amen? And he makes it possible. Let's go on in chapter uh, when we move down to verse 26, 
Are you, are you getting it? I See, you know, well, the wonderful thing about studying words like the way we're studying, you get the picture all the way through. You know, you just don't get little chosen or certain verses, but then you begin to realize that God is building something here, building and building and building and building. And he's trying to get something across to the people. Look what he says in verse 26 of, of 20. And ye shall be holy to me. And you shall be holy to me. And you shall be holy to me. For I am the Lord am holy. I don't know how, how else we can slide. That's why I've been thinking about like, how would I get a picture? How, if I have, if I serve a holy God, what does that mean that he is holy? And how does that reflect upon me how I should be? And he's saying here, and you shall be holy to me. We're coming to him. We're to be holy to me. For I am the Lord, am holy, and have separated you from the peoples that you should be mine. Of course, he's continuing to talk about the Levites, the priests, and others. But I think it goes even deeper than that, where we ourselves are to be separated unto the Lord. Then over in 22, uh, verse 32. He says, you shall not profane my holy name. Now, here comes another one. We're not only talking about a holy God, but there's a lot of people that take the name of God and use it in vain. I don't know. You know I, and I, I know a lot of Christians that do the same thing. <laughs> and I'm thinking about, okay, there's a challenge here coming up because he says here, you shall not profane my holy name, but I will be hallowed amongst the children of Israel. I am the Lord who sanctifies you. So how do we become holy? And he says, I am the one who sanctifies you. I do it by anointing you by the power of his Holy Spirit. I do it by covering you with the precious blood of the Lamb in our side of the covenant. He is the one. He is saying, I'm the one. You don't come to me holy. There's no way you can come to me holy. But I look upon you and I see, even though you're a diamond in the rough, he sees that, yes, I can make you into a beautiful diamond because I'm the creator of all heaven and the earth. I can make you into something that will glorify me. I am the Lord who sanctifies you. We give that what we have unto him and he blesses it back. And he says, be careful how you use my name. Because if you're using my name in vain and you're using my name in ways that it should not be used, my presence will not be with you. And also, you're not going to be in my presence at all. We need to be sanctified from the inside out. Our hearts need to be sanctified, our thoughts need to be sanctified, and our mouths need to be sanctified. Amen? Where he sanctifies us. We continue on as we look here in uh, chapter 32 of Leviticus. We jump over here and now just get a little bit further on. I'd like to be able to cover all of Leviticus today as, as one actually, sorry, 22 uh, verses uh, 32 to 33. 22, 30, 32 to 33. Okay, we, went, we just went through that. Sorry. Now we're over in 27. You can tell I'm all excited today. <laughs> because I love it when you don't stand a chance on your own, but with God, all things are possible. <laughs> and his grace and his peace and his mercy is all there. And he does it all. He gives us all to it because of his, he, how he sanctifies us through Christ Jesus. 2714, he talks a little bit about, and when a man dedicates, you know, well, here he's talking about his house, your physical house. He says, and when a man dedicates his house to be holy to the Lord, then the priest shall set up a value of it. And he goes, so he's talking about, you know, when you set the side as holy to the Lord, well, we got one more verse. I mean, again, every one of these verses is almost like a sermon we can, we can look at. 
And I hope that you'll go back and study them and, and take those little notes that we send you and go back and study the verses because there's so much more around the verses. But he goes on and, and uh, in verse 32 of the last chapter of 20, 27 of, of Leviticus, he said, And concerning the tithe, the herd of or of the flock, of whatever passes under the rod, the tenth of the one shall be holy to the Lord. <laughs> Maybe we're a little bit lucky today or blessed because we're moving on uh, through the year and maybe I'll have to go back. But, you know, we talked about how we set aside our homes as holy to the Lord. And now we're going to, he says, the tithe. And uh, I don't know if you've ever thought about it when you hand in your tithe or give away your gifts and that. You're giving away something that is holy to the Lord. And you know, as I looked at this verse, I got thinking a little bit this morning. You know, so often people send gifts and finances and thank you for it and keep doing it. Okay. We, you know, we got so much vision yet that we pray that the Lord is, the Lord is giving. But we just thinking about as I thought about this verse is that when I opened up those envelopes or see it on the internet or through however way people have given, I shouldn't just think that these, oh, praise God, this is another gift. We can go do something else. I got thinking about, you know, when you get that check or whatever it is physically in your hand that somebody has given, that this is holy unto the Lord. I thought, how awesome is that how awesome is that that god gives us an opportunity that all that he pours into us all that he gives back to us he's saying i just want you to take a tenth of it and use it for my glory use it unto my people given unto the church given unto missions wherever you give it but remember as we give it it's holy unto the lord and those of us who are receiving those gifts need to remember it's coming as a gift of God's love, his grace, his mercy, and his holiness. So I don't know if you've seen today as we look through Leviticus, where he has tried to get across to the people that I am a holy God and that I will sanctify you so you can be a holy people. And I will sanctify you as a holy people so that you can serve me and minister unto me. And that as you give, that whatever you give is holy unto the Lord. Isn't that amazing? Doesn't that bless you? Give me some feedback if you want to. And I just, but I was just blessed today when I was reading these scriptures again last night and this morning thinking, wow, what a holy God we serve. And how that holy God wants to walk with us hand in hand, you know, as we live here on earth. And how he wants to empower us, how he wants to anoint us, how he wants to draw us close to his heart. How he wants us to be a servant that we can come and worship him. And how he sanctifies us so we can take that which he's given to us and give it to others as holy unto the Lord. For God says, I am holy. I am holy. Father, we thank you, Lord, for what you're teaching us and showing us. And may we continue just to grow and mature in those areas that we need to understand about your holiness. Lord, we even don't know how to even focus, how to even get a picture of that in our mind. But Lord, I just pray that we will picture in our heart that you are the Shekinah glory, the power of the anointed one, the Holy Spirit flowing through us. And Lord, that through the power of the Holy Spirit, we are able to walk in holiness because you sanctify us. You cleanse us. You wash us. And oh God, as you speak into our hearts to share with that which we have given to us with others, Lord, that as it passes under your hand, Lord, under whatever it is that you have, oh God, that we may give it as holy unto the Lord, holy unto you. And Father, for those of us who receive it, help us never to forget that those who are giving, those who are sharing, are sharing of your holiness. And we should receive it as a sacrifice and a gift of holiness into the ministries that we are involved in. 
So we thank you now. Bless the people. Lord, encourage us in this last day of the month now. And may we continue to move forward, not in our ability, not in our power, not in our strength, but in your power and in your ability now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. God bless you. How does it feel to be a child of God who's been sanctified and made holy so you can come into the Holy of Holies and worship a holy God? Amen. We love you. And Lord willing, we hope to see you again tomorrow. All right. Keep on keeping on. Bye-bye for now.